Uh, first of all, let me just say to Mark and to uh, all of the, uh, the staff here at the uh, Chamber of Commerce of Greater New York, thank you for the work that you do uh, on behalf of, of businesses in the, in the Greater New York area. Uh, it is vitally important that you continue that service and that work. And to all of you here this morning, thank you for hearing me out. Uh, before I get into reporting on the Bronx, be, while I see a lot of familiar faces here, uh, I think that uh, for those of you who don't know me, I should go back a little bit. I am a Bronx boy. I'm the youngest of three. Uh, my parents are from Puerto Rico. Papi's from Bayamón. Served in the U.S. Army, as it was stated earlier. Uh, after being honorably discharged, came to New York City, to Brooklyn. My mother, at the tender age of 9 or 10, came here with her siblings and my grandmother uh, from Ponce, Puerto Rico, to Washington Heights. They then start working at factories in Lower Manhattan, uh, and they fall in love, start a family, end up in the Bronx. I, as well as my brother and sister, my sister is a retired police officer at Neiman College, Neiman High School, where I transferred myself over in my senior year, chasing after a young lady at Stevenson High School. <laughs> and Stevenson High School, Michael Benjamin will tell you this, was not the best school in the area, even though it was our own school, that's why my parents put me leaving high school. But in my senior year, I transferred myself over, and it was probably the best decision that I made, even though it was a, a not a great school, because 29 years later, <laughs> That young lady is still my girlfriend and still my wife. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We, are, we are parents to two young men, uh, not boys, they're young men. We have been able to cut unemployment. When I first took office, ladies and gentlemen, I, the unemployment rate was 14.1%. We came in, you know, there was a recession nationwide, uh, and, you know, there was an economic cold, so to speak, a chest cold that the nation had. Well, the Bronx had pneumonia. <laughs> and our unemployment rate was 14.1%. Now, uh, we've cut it by more than half. We're there, there this past time, this is not a one-shot deal. This is a farm system. So now, based on my relationship with Mark, I will say this student, Marlene, was with me, but her interest is more geared towards financing. I've already been able to work on the source skills. Why don't you take her next summer? And because of that level of trust that we have and that network that we have, he will then take that student. Hopefully, or what, I'm, what, we, what we need to do is make sure that these uh, individuals, over a period of time, whether they high, when they go from high school to college, what, what I would hope is that Mark, as an employer, ultimately has an individual three, four, five summers and by the time that individual graduates from college, guess what? There's an already made, trained, dedicated uh, staff in the borough. These are some of the conversations that I believe we need to have moving forward as a city. Uh, and we don't have to do it in a, in, a, in a cantankerous way. I'm not into beating you down to show you that I support something else. If we disagree, we disagree. Um, and I, I believe that the art of, uh, of compromising conversation uh, and being disagreeable has left us. Uh, as I move forward, um, Lord knows what is going to happen in the future, but I fully expect to be part of this citywide conversation. And so I hope that this is the first of many of those conversations. Thank you for hearing me out. I fully understood that one size is not fit all in our borough. It is the reason why I was against the mayor's MIATQA zoning laws, um, because it was a cookie cutter approach. So when you look, for instance, at the, the Jerome Avenue corridor uh, rezoning from 167th Street all the way north, um, and it's tricky because there's a canard that we are in Spanish, say, Aido and Pobrecito Bronx. Do we have poor people in the Bronx? Absolutely. But do we have a working class citizenry? Yes. And for too long, we've had brain drain. And if you look at a development like Villa Verde, where we did a tower of low income housing from 30%, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, define AMI in a minute, from 30% to 60% of AMI, but then we did duplex home ownership. You look at the home ownership, they were bought fast, and they were bought by Bronx sites. 
If you look at some of the market ap rate apartments already in Mount Haven, Bronxites are the ones. Uh, I always mention a young lady, Clarissa. She was brought up and raised in Patterson. Her grandmother, Abuelita, still lives in Patterson houses, which is on the other side of the Major Deacon. She made it through cocotazos and hard work from her grandmother, who was there firm and strong and, and hard on her. She did well for herself. She refused to leave the Bronx. She didn't want to be in Patterson, so she moved to Mount Haven. She pays market rate, and she's there with her grandmother. Uh, and, then, and then for those of you who don't know of AMI, AMI is the area medium income, and that's a for federal formula. That formula is something out of my control. The federal government has to deal with it um, and, and change it if it needs to be changed. The AMI formula is based on Westchester, New York City, and Long Island, which some may think is not fair. So they take the medium income of all of that catchment area, and then they'll say, well, this is what we believe the medium income of, say, a family of four is. So the, eight, the current formula right now for a family for is $90,000 a year. In other words, if I say that we're going to do a building with 100% of AMI, it means that a family making, a family of four making $90,000 a year or more, I mean making more than $90,000 a year, <coughs> doesn't qualify. Now think about a school bus driver, think about a teacher, think about if they're together, their salaries already exceed 100% of the AMI. I'll give you even one. So many of us in government and so many here um, um, have championed the cause of crime in the Bronx. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that we were doing a lot better. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a resident, well, the past resident of the Bronx. I grew up there. Unfortunately, about two weeks ago, my nephew was playing basketball. Some of them might have heard of it. At 22 Park, 166 in Finley Avenue. And he was shot after making a layup. Um, good kid, just helped his grandfather with steps of groceries. And they, after interrogating one of the guys at the hospital that was there with him, they mentioned that you know it was a gang-related issue, right. whereby the individuals on one side of that park want to take over the gang. I mean, my point is, what's being done with the gang violence specifically in the Bronx? What, what's the issue? So, a um, couple of things here. Um, just, to, just to put it in perspective, uh, when I was 17 years old, 1990, I'm 45 years old now, 1990, the homicide rate in the Bronx was 650 one year. Last year we were at 72. Um, this year we are in the mid-70s, year to date. But we're still on pace to be under 100. Uh, so uh, I don't know how to celebrate that. You can't because that means that there's still families. And then our overall, um, when you look at the index crime, uh, you, look, you, you see that we have a reduction, but there's still pockets. So we have 12 precincts in the Bronx. And it's very difficult to tell people who live in five out of the 12 precincts that crime overall crime is down. lack of a better word, we dismiss the pain of the family. We dismiss um, what the victim or who the victim was or is because we think, oh, they were all you know, in the game. And that's not necessarily the case. So we just have to do better about educating ourselves and so that the resources are there. And we have an increase now along with the last police academy. I think we received, I think, 318 million police officers that are being assigned to the higher risk um, um, uh, precincts, the 4-0, the 4-4, 4-6, the 5-2, 4 Thank you. Mike. Yeah, I love your post, and we have a pretty black rock. We're happy with the head of our employees. Mm -hmm. um, what's the business climate like in the Bronx for businesses, for growing, transportation, housing, et cetera, things that are being done to attract businesses to Florida? Well, one of the things that we have, and this is why she's here, Marlene Sintron. Uh, Marlene Sintron is, again, the president of the Bronx Global Economic Development Corporation. Uh, but, it, you know, the, the BOEDC has so many different things. Chambers Plug, one of them is the Bronx Tourism Council. Tourism is up 14% last year. Um, and it's not just the Yankees, even though, damn, I wish they were there. Um, we're more than just, you know, the Botanical Gardens and the Zoo. Uh, the, the increase is happening because of our nightlife, our hospitality field, we have the first ever um, um, uh, Marriott Marquis 125 bed residence in. Uh, we work with right ne your next door neighbor at the post is uh, Fresh Direct. Uh, and all of that comes from the advocacy and from the monies that, oh, Sunday is the Bronx, as the tour of the Bronx, the largest free cycling event, that's the shameless club, the largest free cycling event in the state of New York. But, uh, with the BOEDC, Molly, you, you, um, you guys give out loans 
Um, they they um, have a state um, license. They give out loans to uh, the tune of millions of dollars a year. A year. Uh, it doesn't have to just be to Bronx businesses. What she's been able to do is invite businesses from other areas. For instance, the Bronx Brewery <coughs> at one time was only Bronx in name. They were out in Connecticut, right? When I read that there was a Bronx Brewery, that there was somebody who had the foot squad and the courage <laughs> to use Bronx as part of their marketing, but they weren't from the Bronx, I said, go get them. <laughs> she went and got them and was able to lend them money and we situated them now they're in Port Morris and they're thriving. So one of the things that we one of the things that we do is that certainly we advocate, we did that for Fresh Direct, who was gonna lead to New Jersey, and um, we were able to save you over twenty two hundred jobs. Yes, since I'm an as well. Um, I'd like to you to address what is being done with the infrastructure, particularly transportation um, and roadways in the Bronx. One of the things I've always found most challenging is the Cross Bronx Expressway or just uh, uh, but it makes it, it does make it difficult. I live in Queens now, but I'm always in the Bronx, a big Yankee fan. I, I have a lot of relatives there. And sometimes it does affect how your desire to, you, the desire to get there because you, it, it's difficult. So you brought the cross Bronx, let's just be clear. <laughs> <laughs> I am mortal. <laughs> um, so, so transportation infrastructure, we, we, have to, we have to be, um, we have to multitask. One of the things that we were able to do uh, a couple of months ago is open up the first Bronx ferry stop, which is wildly popular. And it's part of that East River uh, route. Uh, I believe the Bronx sites love it. Uh, we are already in conversations uh, to see where we can put the second stop. It is over there in, in Classic Point um, in Soundview. Uh, the problem is that we still have too many people who are driving their cars to take the ferry, and that's a residential area. Uh, we need to we need to think differently. A lot of times we think that ferry stops should be in a residential area, but it could be in a place where we can provide more car spaces, like Ferry Point Park. Um, if you look at Ferry Point Park, it's not too far from where the, where the ferry is now, but a lot of the people from Throttlenet and, um, and, and Morris Park and Pelham, they're driving to Soundview. We can have them go right to Ferry Point Park. I believe the capacity there for anywhere between two and 300 vehicles. They can take the ferry, and then when they come back, they put them right around, uh, they go right around the, the, uh, the, uh, the cul-de-sac from the New Bridge into the highway. So we, we need to do more ferry. Not in the Bronx, but in the city of New York, ferry, ferry works. Uh, it, it connects great neighborhoods. Hilda and I played hooky one Friday from work over the summer. And you know what we did? We took the ferry on a Friday, because we live in Soundview. So we rode our bikes through the park, parked our bikes in my sister-in-law's house, which lives right across the street from where the ferry is. Uh, we took two beach chairs and a cooler for a couple of beers, took the ferry all the way down to Wall Street, transferred over, went to Far Rockaway, we were in a different world. Far Rockaway Beach, right? And we were able to get a little tipsy. <laughs> Not to worry about driving. Friday um, uh, traffic, none of that. We came right back, scenic route. It was beautiful. Uh, so we need to do more of that. And think about uh, the, the different communities, especially, I believe, the three boroughs, Queens, Brooklyn, and the Bronx, where the majority of, of um, job creation is happening and will continue to happen over the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years. We need, to, we need to be able to connect the three boroughs. I think ferry is one way to do it. Uh, rail is another way. So I am in the, uh, we were able to dust off a 40-year plan uh, for four Metro North stations, which I mentioned earlier. And they are about 60% financed. The next five-year uh, capital plan will, will do is about 1.2, 1.3 $1 billion dollar project. The rails are already there. It's the New Haven Line, which Amtrak owns. So Amtrak, is there, is, is anybody from Amtrak here? <laughs> but if there is, I want to fight with you. <laughs> Amtrak keeps moving the goalposts back, and we really need them to sign a, an MOU by December so that we can be on timeline. Uh, what we would hope is uh, to have the four Metro North Station built so that by the time Eastside Access opens up for the LIRR, 
they give some of the slots in Penn Station for us to come in. We're looking at 21, 22, the latest. So rail is a, is a, is a big component. Um, in terms of um, infrastructure, I spoke about $1.8 billion, where we're gonna have over um, flyovers from the Brooklyn into Hunts Point to get trucks off the streets, open up the, um, the, uh, the Sheridan. Uh, with regards to the Cross Bronx, the Cross Bronx, uh, you know, we're having more and more uh, conversations with state DOT and city DOT who always point the finger at each other about who is responsible for the maintenance. If you look, I, it's been a pet peeve of mine, I walk around, videotaping um, the, the different highways, so you see now the trucks. Some people get mad because it backs up traffic, but you see now the trucks coming in and they're sweeping up and cleaning up, um, and so I'm happy with that. Uh, we, we, there are a number of things that we can do with the, with the Cross Bronx. One of the things is something long-term that's perhaps far beyond, and more seriously, I mean, Joe, but it should be probably far beyond my political lifetime, but maybe um, having a, a second, an upper deck, um, Currently, one of our major problems is the grading uh, stations with people who are at, at, in all sides of, of the issue, uh, that we can still lead this country and, 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 and the world for that matter in economic development, in uh, transport, and being innovative when it comes to transportation, being innovative, and in, in just giving people an opportunity. Just give people the chance. Give a boy or girl in the public school system the, uh, the chance, the equipment, the resources. Uh, give a small business uh, person, or somebody who just has a good product, somebody who just knows how to bake. That's what we do in the Bronx, somebody who has a great recipe, who may not understand the business of baking. Give them the chance, give them the resources, give them the technical assistance. If you do, if we, we can do that. Uh, but I believe that, that you know, um, we, we, as big as the city is, uh, and this is what I try to do in a different approach in the Bronx, and the Bronx is big. The Bronx is the, the size of, of Philly when it comes to population. People don't really understand that. Um, that that we, we, as government, have lost our way in going into the nuances of issues that ultimately affect people's lives. And you do that a little bit at a time, but it works for the greater good. That, for me, is what's fun about government that is the reason why I got involved in government. And that's the only reason, and I believe that the only position that I can do that is out of City Hall, out of Gracie Mansion. And it's the only reason why I will stay in government. I will be, again, 48 years old in 2021, young, but elected 26 years of my life. So, time has come. <laughs> get back to networking, and I want to thank uh, the borough president and his staff, Marlene Citron. I saw Dirk McCall here. Dirk used to work for the Greenwich Village Chamber of Commerce. So the Bronx is booming because the Bronx is looking out for all of us. And you can see here we have a true visionary leader who not only uh, talks about it, but he's getting it done, and he's a man of the people. And as we said when we began, um, He's term limited, so who knows where he'll be in 2021. Thank you for coming, and let's get back to network.